Thanks, everyone. So what I want to do tonight, as quickly as possible, is give you a little bit of update on what you all have heard about is going on with legislation in California, at the federal level, and a couple of other states, but also what's going on um, with the regulations um, uh, promulgated by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the United States Department of Agriculture, and then also give you a bit of a primer on how this stuff works, because I think there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding as to how it works. And I'll give you an example. Um, as you all may be aware, a Pacific white-sided dolphin that was born in captivity in Japan has, has just been allowed to be imported into the United States by the National Marine Fishery Service. They gave um, they, they issued a permit to import that animal. There is always a public comment period when uh, permits are issued or proposed to be issued under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And somebody on, um, out there in the, in the, um, in the internet uh, sphere thought that that public comment period was an opportunity for people to weigh in on their opinion and that the agency would then make a decision based on the preponderance of opinions they heard. And while that might sound good for us, you know, because we have very strong opinions and very passionate feelings about this, and we will all send in 20,000 comments on the Lolita or 9,000 comments on the beluga whales that are potentially, um, that, that were proposed for import in from, from Russia by the Georgia Aquarium, the fact is, is that the bad guys have a lot of opinions too, and, you know, and they can also send in 9,000 comments or 20,000 comments. You wouldn't want these decisions to be based on public opinion. They are based on law. So when the public comment period for a permit application is opened, it's not so that the agency can hear what your opinion is. It's so that they can do their due diligence and hear from as many different segments of the public sectors of the public on facts and legal arguments that can assist them in making their opinion. They are just, you know, let's say 10 people in an agency. They are not necessarily going to know about everything that's going on out there. They're going to try to do their research, but we have an opportunity in this great country of ours and our democracy to weigh in with our agencies and tell them, we know this fact, we know this information, or we have had these lawyers look at the question and they have these arguments. And so that gives us that opportunity and then they take those facts and legal arguments and feed them into their decision process. Quite frankly, and I don't want to discourage you from expressing your opinion, but they're not elected officials. So if they get 9,000 um, letters that all say the same thing, don't import this animal, it's the wrong thing to do, they have absolutely no obligation to pay the slightest bit of attention to that. They are not elected officials. All right? They are subject only to the law, and the law has certain requirements. So what we need to do as the engaged public is tell them how they can meet those requirements or how this permit does not meet those requirements because of these facts or this legal argument and so on. So when I write my comments, I consult with lawyers, I do my research, and I try to give the agency information that will assist them in making what I consider to be the right decision under the law. Does that make sense? You're not telling them what you feel. I mean, you can. You're certainly welcome to do that as well. But they are under, under no obligation by the law to, to listen to that. They're not elected, okay? So in the end, when they make a decision that doesn't agree with your opinion, they may be breaking the law as well, and then we would want to sue and see if we can't, because believe me, the government breaks the law that they are supposed to follow and implement all the time, right? And, I, and that's where all those lawsuits come from, is because the government is breaking the law. We're not suing, you know, you know they're not suing um, the Miami Aquarium. They're suing APHIS. They're not, we're not suing, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think about, we're not suing the Macaw tribe about the gray whale hunt. We're suing the National Marine Fisheries Service for not implementing the law correctly in that hunt proposal. Does that make sense? Okay, so, you know, I prefer that our government be subject to the law and not mob rule, because that's what we're talking about. You know, if it was just our opinion that made them do what they need, you know, what they do, then that's mob rule. And you don't want that. You want, it does, I'm not defending the government by any means. The fact is, as I said, they break the law all the time. And sometimes when they break the law, we can't do anything about it. And that's when you really start to feel like, oh, what kind of country do we live in today? You know, because, you know, can we find grounds for a lawsuit? Can we get the lawyers who are willing to take the risk 
to file that lawsuit? Can we find the legal arguments that are strong enough to stand up in court? All right? Sometimes the law is badly written. Let's just face it. Sometimes the law is vague and it's poorly written. And if you try to sue because you feel that, they, that the government made the wrong decision under the law, it might be all mushy and squishy and the judge ends up not, not saying the right thing. And then do you push it all the way to the Supreme Court? What do you do? You know, I mean, those are, that's, that, that's what happens, okay? The court, by the way, doesn't make law. The court interprets law. And I've also had a lot of constituents think that, by the way, I was meaning to put up a pretty picture while I was rattling on like this. Um, the, the, you know, I've had a lot of constituents think that the court, when they, when they rule in a case, has actually like changed the law. When they, that's what they're supposed to do. You know, for all of you who were in Government 101 when you were in grade school, it's Congress who makes the laws, right? It's the legislative branch that makes the laws. But the courts interpret them. And sometimes when they interpret them, they interpret them in a new way, which is what all of this stuff is going on at the Supreme Court. They, make, they rule that corporations are people. Okay, that's a, a reinterpretation of a law that's been on the books for a long time. And that's disturbing to me. I don't know if it's disturbing to you, but it's certainly disturbing to me. And, but they didn't make new law when they did that. They just interpreted an old law in a different way. So the courts don't make law. Congress makes laws. Congress isn't supposed to interpret laws. The courts are supposed to do that. And the executive is supposed to implement the law. Which, of course, that's NOAA, that's NIMS, that's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's APHIS. <laughs> And they break the law all the time. They don't, inter they don't implement it properly or they implement it grossly incorrectly. So, in a sense, sometimes our own government is criminal. And that's why we sue them to make them follow the law properly. That's what we're doing when we file lawsuits. We're not just trying to stop something that's bad. We actually feel the law has been broken and we're trying to make it be implemented correctly. All right, so these are the statutes that regulate our animals out here in, um, in the San Juan Islands. The MMPA, which was passed in 1972. The Endangered Species Act, which was passed in 1973. And I hope you recognize that that was when Nixon was president. Okay? He was a very bad man, but he was really actually very good to the environment. All right? He passed all of these laws. He signed them into law. All right? Um, the National Environmental Policy Act, which actually is from the 60s and actually is the law we sue under the most because it's a procedural act. And if the government is going to break the law, that's nine times out of ten how they do it. They break the law by not doing something procedurally that they were supposed to do. All right? They skip a corner. They, they cut a corner. They, they skip a step. They, they don't do something they were supposed to do. They, they do an environmental assessment when they should have done an environmental impact statement, you know, which are technical things that you don't need to worry about. But all of that's under the National Environmental Policy Act. They're supposed to review things before the government does things to make sure that what they're going to do isn't going to harm the environment. All right? And... If they skip steps or don't ever do things that they're supposed to do, then we can sue under that law, and they, at the very least, have to go back to the drawing board and do the things they, they didn't do. So a lot of our lawsuits are actually under NEPA. And then there's the Animal Welfare Act, which, by the way, is extremely difficult to get enforced properly via the judicial system, because we find that the way the law is written, it's very difficult for us as NGOs or citizens to get standing to bring the suit. Lolita cannot sue the government. She is not a person. This is what Howie was talking about, how the non-human person um, uh, initiative is trying to get her personhood. All right? um, she's not a person under the law, and so she can't bring the lawsuit. We have to bring it on her behalf. And it's very difficult to get standing to sue on behalf of an animal. All right, and so it's not that the law is broken, is not being broken, it's being broken all the time. APHIS breaks their own law all the time, but it's just very, very difficult for us to do anything about it. You might say, oh my God, it sounds like there's no law at all. And you're kind of right. <laughs> um, the Administrative Procedures Act is actually just, you know, sort of exactly what it looks like. It's just, you know, this is how the government's supposed to do things. And there's a standard under that law that is generally, for things like the Animal Welfare Act and the um, Marine Mammal Protection Act, neither of which have the right of citizens to sue embodied in them, 
The Endangered Species Act is different in that regard. It actually has what's called a citizen suit provision. You can bring a suit under the ESA saying the government is breaking the law and you want it you know, to be enforced properly. But to bring a suit under the MMPA or the Animal Welfare Act, you have to usually do it under the APA, which is that, I don't know how many of you have ever heard this phrase, arbitrary and capricious. <laughs> that arbitrary and capricious standard. The government is behaving arbitrarily and capriciously. How many of you have heard that? Yeah, that's the APA. If the government's just sort of saying, um, um, Howie actually mentioned something about that. He basically said that provision in the uh, original uh, listing of the southern residents as endangered just arbitrarily and capriciously left Lolita out of it. They just said with no justification, no explanation, no basis, by the way, the any whales that were caught, you know, and are in captivity now before this listing became, um, was enacted, are not included in it. That would meet the arbitrary and capricious standard, which was what happened in that lawsuit, all right, and, and eventually they won, okay? And so now they are proposing a rule to include her, and I'll get to that in a second. So, and then finally, the Lacey Act, which is kind of a, a strange little um, law that's quite old. Um, I think it's from before the 60s. And basically what it says is, is that you can't transport across state law, uh, state boundaries, but across state borders, any wildlife product that was acquired illegally. That was, you know, caught illegally or bought illegally or traded illegally in its point of origin. You can't bring that across a state border. All right, and so bringing in an illegally caught whale from Mexico or something like that um, into the U.S. would be illegal potentially under the MMPA, but also under the Lacey Act. Okay, we very rarely have to worry about the Lacey Act. I just bring it up because it is relevant to transport across state borders, and I will never mention it again. <laughs> so now I'm just going to really quickly run through international treaties. Um, we've got the CITES. How many of you know about CITES? Yeah, you know, this is the act, not the act, but the treaty um, that the, um, is administered, and I'll tell you by who in a second, by, um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to um, control trade in endangered species. And there's like 190 countries that are party to it. It is a very big treaty. Um, we've got the World Trade Organization, which probably all are, is, is really, scary, you know, basically it's a very scary um, agreement because it basically says commerce is more important than environmental protection, which is pretty much how we run the world. The Convention on Biological Diversity relates to marine mammals, so does the Convention on Migratory Species. They are the kings and queens of migratory species. Um, and then various regional bilateral agreements, including ASCBANS, ACABANS, and the Cartagena Convention. We are a party to the last one. The SPA protocol is what prevents capturing um, whales and dolphins in the Caribbean. And just as a little tidbit that will surprise none of you, we were the last Caribbean country to sign the SPA protocol, we being the US, one of the last, not the last, but one of the last Caribbean countries, you know, we have Florida, of course, um, to, uh, and, and you know, you laugh, but some people are like, we're not in the Caribbean. Um, the, the SPA protocol, uh, we were one of the last to sign it because the industry, the public display industry, was lobbying the government not to sign it at all because they didn't want us to be bound by a treaty that prevents capturing these animals in the wild. They wanted to keep the Caribbean open as a possible source of animals. And so when SeaWorld says they're a conservation organization, this is the sort of thing they do. They don't come to these forums to improve protection for these animals. They, make, they, they go to weaken them so that they can keep certain areas open as sources of animals. They did it with uh, the IWC as well. So the U.S. Department of Commerce is responsible for, uh, they uh, have the agencies, the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is also known as NOAA Fisheries, and they're responsible for these three laws in that order. They are responsible for whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions under the MFPA. They're responsible for whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions under the ESA. And they're responsible for whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions under CITES. The U.S. Department of Interior has the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're responsible for these three same laws, same treaty, in a different order, okay? So they're responsible for the ESA in general. So everything you think of as an endangered species, the Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for, but they cede some of that responsible for whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions 
to the F to the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. Are you starting to understand why I called it alphabet soup? Um, they are responsible for implementing CITES via the ESA. So our domestic legislation, the Endangered Species Act, implements our treaty obligations under CITES. Right? And then finally, they are responsible for the MMPA, dugongs, manatees, sea otters, and walruses, and polar bears. So those five species only are the Fish and Wildlife Service responsible for. Every other marine mammal is, is NIMS's responsibility. And if you want to know why, because, you know, hey, walrus is a pinniped too, so why aren't they with NIMS? It's completely history. It's completely arbitrary and capricious, and it's due to history. Okay, so before 1972, when the MMPA was passed, this was sort of how they divided up these responsibilities. No, it didn't even exist prior to 1972. It was one of the things that was created, um, yeah, around 1970, I think, actually. And, and it was, the MMPA was one of the first things this new department became responsible for, this new agency. And, um, and so because the Fish and Wildlife Service worked a lot in Alaska, and that's where a lot of those species I just mentioned are from, except for the manatees and the dugongs. So they were responsible for the animals that were in Alaska, except for the whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions. Okay, so it ma makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't make sense to them either. And then the Department of Agriculture is responsible. Um, APHIS is responsible for the Animal Welfare Act. Okay? Are you all thoroughly confused by now? <laughs> Welcome to my life. All right, so the Code of Federal Regulations is how the laws are implemented. Regulations implement legislation. That's probably the most clear message I'm going to give you. If you go home and remember that, all right, my job is done. Um, so the MMPA right now is going under a perm is undergoing a permit regulations review. Um, this is something that they started quite a while ago. This is a, a letter we wrote. This is the kind of letter I write um, when the public comment period is open for some sort of action like this. And we will put out action alerts and we will give you talking points and we will ask you to weigh in as well. But you'll notice that we give you um, talking points that are factual and may even have some legal arguments thrown in there. Because again, if you just write to the agency when a public comment period like this is open and just say, this is what I feel or this is, you know, I think this is wrong for these animals to be in captivity and you should, you should, you should let them all go, they're not obligated to pay any attention to that. What they need to hear is what's wrong with the way we're implementing the law right now. We are trying to revise our regulations, which is what this is all about. And there are elements in these regulations that are related to public display. So we're saying, for example, this is a paragraph from this comment letter, that you, know, you actually have authority to continue to oversee these facilities even though in 1994 the MMPA was amended to take away a lot of your authority. It's not completely gone. You actually still have to make sure that they're following an education program. All right? That's one of the requirements to be a public display facility. Um, Sam mentioned this last night, um, if you came to the Q&A. The fact is, is that prior to 1988, you know, it was just an exemption in the law. You could be a public display facility. But after 1988, they actually had to have an education program. In 1994, pretty much all of the jurisdiction of the National Marine Fishery Service was taken away from uh, public display. They were no longer co-managers of public display with APHIS. But they retained this one element. They were supposed to make sure that these facilities had an education program. They're still saying they have absolutely no authority over, the, over public display under the MMPA. And we're like, well, you know, what if they just stopped educating them, even pretending they were educating them? How would you, they would do that in breaking the law. And how would we know that if you don't retain some sort of authority or monitoring ability over them? And if you watch the April, to, um, April 27, 2010 oversight hearing that was on C-SPAN, where I also testified, and so did Julie Scardina of SeaWorld, if you watch that, which is archived on C-SPAN, you'll see how the National Marine Fisheries Service argues that they have no jurisdiction over public display of any sort anymore. But that can't be true, because these provisions still exist in the law, and they have to have some oversight, or they can't enforce those provisions. So again, the government breaks the law all the time. In our opinion right now, NIMS is breaking the law on this point. And, and Congress at the time kind of agreed with us, but then there was an election. And a lot of this, that's not, those committee members left. So, the AWA, they are also undergoing standards review. Um, and this is a, a letter that you might recognize um, was just very recently written by several um, congressmen 
to APHIS, basically telling them, you are now 18 years delinquent in that permit, um, in that uh, regulatory uh, overview. They were supposed to update the regulations back in 1997 or 8, at least. Yeah, 16 years. Um, and they haven't done it. They haven't done it. They proposed a rule in 2002. That's 12 years ago. They proposed a rule. There was a public comment period. There's been no final rule. All right, so they are now way out of date in updating. These are the regulations, by the way, that dictate whether uh, what size tank should be, what kind of water quality should this tank have. All right, they those standards that are currently keeping, for instance, um, Lolita in the box she's in, which is also actually illegal. It's not actually even up to these minimum standards of APHIS, but let's set, set that aside for the moment and just assume it is legal. It's still a box. It's a very small box. Why is that legal? Because those are 30 years out of date, those regulations. 30 years out of date with the science that we now have, out of date with all of the, the work that some researchers have come up with that you know, show, for instance, that bigger is better. A bigger tank is a better tank. And so the reason APHIS is 12 years out of date with the final rule is because they just don't want to make this decision. It's going to really upset somebody. It's going to upset us because they didn't make a big enough improvement, or it's going to upset the industry because it's too much of an improvement. So they don't even want to, this, they're being cowards. They're just not publishing this rule. And so the, these congressmen wrote this letter saying, look, you know, you got to do this. This is getting a little bit. Um, legislation. So those are two regulatory um, processes that are underway right now. Domestic, and fed, uh, domestic legislation, federal and state. We've got um, the Ad Probes Amendment. How many of you remember just a few weeks ago that uh, Schiff and um, Huffman, so this is Adam Schiff and Huffman, uh, Jared Huffman, uh, passed an amendment, and that's how it came across in the media, they passed an amendment that gave a million dollars to the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to do research on how to improve the, reg the, the standards for marine mammals in captivity, particularly orcas. They were very concerned about orcas. And they basically said, this money is for you to do your job. This money is for you to do what you should have done 12 years ago, which is finalize this rule. Okay, if y'all remember that, that's what I'm talking about here. So this is an, um, an, uh, an amendment to the Agricultural Appropriations Bill. It passed the committee with unanimous consent, which is really pretty amazing. And it now has to go to the floor of the House, and hopefully it will pass. But that vote hasn't happened yet. And then it'll have to go to the Senate, where hopefully it will pass, but that hasn't happened yet. And if it does, well, we'll actually get the rule. We'll get the final rule at last. But even if it doesn't pass, this is pretty remarkable that it passed the committee by unanimous consent, and it's symbolically really important, right? And I have to tell you that, you know, 15 years ago, I couldn't get Congress interested in this issue, not just me, but all of my colleagues who were working on this issue on Capitol Hill, we couldn't find a single friend in Congress who was willing to go up against SeaWorld and rock the boat like this. And now not only are we finding friends in Congress, but they're rocking the boat. They really are. I mean, they, there's a, a Huffington Post had um, one of uh, Congressman Schiff's public statements just recently about this. He's really willing to champion this issue. And, and these friends came to us Proactively, We did not go to them. We didn't go looking for them. I'd given up on Congress, to be honest. But these guys came to us and said, we know that you're active on this issue. We would like to do this. Give us some help. And we loaded them up with info, and they tweaked the language, and boom, they got it passed by unanimous consent. The MMPA might be amended, and that would be huge. Remember, this is the, the law that in 1994 had jurisdiction from the National Marine Fishery Service, totally stripped from it, and left the fate of captive marine mammals solely to the Department of Agriculture. In other words, once you enter captivity, you cease to be a marine mammal and you turn into a cow. And, <laughs> and basically that's how they're protected, is by a law that protects you know, puppies and puppy mills and cattle in, in livestock lots and all of that, and think about those things that are allowed under that law. And that's the only law that protects them anymore when they're in captivity, as I told you, except for the educational component NIMS doesn't have any jurisdiction anymore. And this is, you know, very much a problem. We'd love for an amendment to return it to the way it was before 1994 when the National Marine Fishery Service and the MMPA did have authority over um, 
public display of these animals because I can guarantee you, if that was still the case, if the pre-1994 stand, uh, situation of the MMPA was still in effect and the National Marine Fishery Service had jurisdiction with APHIS over captive marine mammals, all of the stuff that's happened with blackfish and the OSHA ruling and um, the new science, like what John is doing, um, we would have a lot more um, hope that, in fact, orcas would be out of captivity very shortly. I'm going to go through those facts. Everybody knows about AB 2140. The interim study is moving along. And th these are the cotlers, Ava Cotler, Kira Cotler, and Lizzie Graham. Um, and really effective lobbyists there. You know, the, 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 the assembly members ate them up with a spoon. You know, they just love it when little kids come and, and just show that kind of passion and commitment. Um, I don't know if anybody recognizes the dude in the back there, but that's um, Eric. Um, he's, a, he's an actor, and he was our sole celebrity. It was really a lot of fun to have him there, but anyway. Um, so New York has a Senate bill that, you know, is moving along their process. It's symbolic. Obviously, there is no... There are no captive marine mammals in, in New York, but it would be good. This is our letter of support from the Animal Welfare Act to Senator Bell. Um, he's not going to be in the New York legislature anymore, and he's leaving, but um, the bill is still, is still being considered. Florida is now expressing interest in a similar bill to the California bill. That would be fabulous. Um, I'm just telling you there's interest being expressed. I'm not giving you any names. Washington, I'm working with somebody here. Is Anna here? Hi, Anna. I'm, I'd like to speak with you. Um, there's some interest in passing um, a, a piece of legislation here. Again, symbolic, but important symbolic, uh, important symbolism. And then in, uh, Antigua and Barbuda's had a dolphin area in the past, and they're trying to pass a law. The more laws we can get passed in the Caribbean, the better, because they have a lot of swim with the dolphin programs. And then this is a situation where uh, the reason they don't have a facility there anymore is the people who ran this dolphin area over here blocked a drain over here to this lagoon. And then you can imagine blocking that drain causing a bit of a flooding problem in one night. And they got kicked out of the country, but they want to come back. The same company wants to come back. So uh, where was that, did you ask? Antigua Barbuda, the Caribbean. Um, and then China um, is a real problem. And I talked about that last night, so I won't get into it. But this is uh, the Beijing Zoo. And uh, the dolphin area that's within the Beijing Zoo is privately owned. The Beijing Zoo is part of the quasi-governmental Chinese Zoological Association. But this is privately owned. So this is the situation. This is what I'm dealing with on this issue only, not on marine noise, not on whale watching, not on uh, whaling, all these other issues I deal with, just on the public display of these animals. And I'm going to skip the next part because it's, I don't have time. This is about sightings. I just wanted to talk a little bit about sightings, and I'm not going to get into that. It's very common that the CITES does mean something to us because we're trying to control the trade of these animals via CITES. Non-detrimental, um, non-detriment findings are not really worth the paper. They're not printed on. They're not even required to be in, in writing. And so we're, we're trying to work with CITES to improve that situation. Um, and like I said, I'm just going to skip all this because I'm out of time. Um, obviously, captures are still going on everywhere, right? It's, it, this is unlike a lot of zoo animals. This is still um, a taxon that is being brought into public display facilities via the wild. It's really strange when you think about it that you know they don't capture you know zebras anymore. They don't capture giraffes anymore. They don't capture um, hippopotami anymore. They only capture a very few number of species still for zoos, and whales and dolphins are amongst the top. And it's just not. It doesn't make a lot of sense because they are so difficult to capture and they are so prone to capture stress. This was the capture in 1997 of the Taiji 5, which some of you are probably familiar with that. All five of those whales are now dead, and they all died within 11 years. Right. Um, we've got these orbit captures. The Russian situation is described in the last three bullets. Um, I'm working in Russia. I'm going to be in uh, Russia in September trying to deal with the scientific community there, which is silent, kind of like it, it often is here. Uh, he said the balloons is in Vladivostok. This facility is no longer in, in existence. The reason is because ice actually formed over the top of these uh, enclosures in the winter. And the balloons, which are you know, they're able to do this, they broke through the ice and they would get scratched and be bleeding. And people were complaining about the bleeding balugas in the, in the uh, pens in Vladivostok. And so they moved them 40 kilometers um, to the east where nobody can see them. <laughs> 
Um, but I actually saw where these uh, enclosures used to be when I was in Vladivostok, and then I couldn't even get to the 40 kilometers to the east uh, town called Nakotka because I didn't have permission to go there. This is how they capture belugas today. This is still going on. This is what happens every year in the Sea of the Cocks. This is humane. This is humane. And this is what, to give our government credit for the first time ever, that permit that the uh, Georgia Aquarium was seeking to bring in 18 of the animals caught in this manner was denied. Okay, so now the Georgia Aquarium is suing to overturn that decision. The Animal Welfare Institute and three other NGOs have filed in, uh, as interveners on behalf of the government, which is a really strange position for all of us to be in. We're actually their friends in this one. We thought they made the right decision. It was amazing that they made it. And um, so there we go. Um, so questions? A really quick update on what's going on with um, the, the treaties that we are um, party to, to our laws, to our regulations. So, that but, I mean, how much um, does it help to contact your senators and Congress <coughs> people if, if we as non-scientists can't do the comment thing as like we should, as you say, contacting you know, our representatives and saying, you need to get involved in this like that. Yes, like Schiff and Huffman. Yeah. Um, it makes all the difference in the world. Elected officials do have to pay attention to what you say. Executive level, you know, the, uh, the officials that work in the executive branch, other than the president and the vice president, don't have to, you know, worry so much about what you think or believe because they are appointed. They aren't elected. And that's what I mean about how the agency doesn't have to listen to your opinion, but they do have to listen to your facts. Because the law requires them to listen to your facts. So that's why we give talking points to our constituents when they write. The more letters they get about these five talking points, the more there's no way they can avoid answering those questions. So it isn't totally pointless for you to respond, but going to your elected officials is absolutely paramount. And in fact, what you can do is go to your elected officials and say, I want you to write a letter in this public comment period and tell them as Senator Smith, I want you to do the right thing. I need you to follow the law. This law says you can't do this. Because believe me, when Senator Smith says that, it means a hell of a lot more than when even I say, you know, as an NGO that represents some people. They don't like it when Congress looks at what they're doing. And that's a good thing. See. Oh, <laughs> um, there are uh, several facilities that are party to that permit application. The Georgia Aquarium was the permit applicant of record, and they were going to hold. They were going to bring in all 18 whales, and they would be the owners of record. But they cannot hold 18 beluga whales. They can only hold. Well, they can't hold any. Their tank is really small. But you know, they they claim they can hold three more than they've got, and the APHIS regulations agree with them. So they were going to keep three and distribute the other, uh, can I do math? 15, <laughs> to three other facilities. The three SeaWorld parks and the Shedd Aquarium. And potentially Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut eventually. So those other facilities were party to the permit application, but they would not be the permit holder of record. And now that there's a lawsuit, the George Aquarium has sued the government over their decision to deny the permit, again, those three, those four facilities are not part of that lawsuit. It is just the George Aquarium suing the government. But obviously their interests are you know, in play. So that's the connection. SeaWorld is going to get some of those animals if they get into this country. My feeling is, just in case you're wondering, and it might be one of the questions that I get asked, I'll just answer preemptively. I think they will lose their lawsuit. I think the government stood on pretty solid ground. I think. There's a history, there's a legal um, tendency for judges, administrative law judges, to rule with deference to the agency, which when it's us suing the government, really pisses us off. But when it's the industry suing the government, we like that. So the fact is, is that the court's probably going to defer to the agency and say the agency did, you know, we look at the record and they did their due diligence and they answered all the right questions, and so the, rule, the, the decision stands. 
So that's how I feel it's gonna, it's gonna work out and you know, we're, we're doing our best as interveners to make sure that's how it works out. But in the end, you know, we'll see what the judge does and um, it's gonna take a long time for that to play out. Um, it won't even be close to a decision by the end of the year. It'll be another m several months away.